Around the world, tens of millions of people live in so-called sacrifice zones, areas that are often permanently damaged because of pollution from heavy industry. The town of Kabwe in Zambia is known as one of the world's most polluted places. Hundreds of thousands of people live in close proximity to a lead and sink mine which operated for almost a century. Many residents say their children are suffering from toxic consequences and are seeking compensation. People in Power investigates. It's a typical African scene. Kids playing football in the dust on a hot summer afternoon. But in this town, that dust could be deadly. Right next door lies a vast toxic waste dump from an old lead and zinc mine. Lead dust from the dump infects this township and beyond. Kabwe is now billed as one of the most polluted towns on earth. As many as 120,000 people, over half of Kabwe's population, suffer from lead poisoning. Most at risk are mothers and their children. Diana Namwe is one of thousands of parents living close to the old mine. Both her daughter and son exhibit the ill effects of lead. <laughs> Environmental pollution experts have given cities like these a label. The term sacrifice zone refers to an area usually heavily polluted and poor that essentially has been forgotten. Over the years, I've been to many sacrifice zones in uh, just about all continents. But the one that is most serious in, in my 40 years of doing this is the one in Kabwe, Zambia. Professor Jack Caravanos is a world leading authority on environmental lead pollution. And Kabwe has the worst lead pollution he's ever seen. So I've heard where people are comparing different sites and they'll compare, let's say, Kabwe to Chernobyl, and they'll say, which one is more serious and, and why exactly? In 1986, an accident at Chernobyl, a Soviet nuclear power plant, caused one of the world's worst environmental disasters. And I, I have a simple answer to that. Right now in Kabwe, there is confirmed ongoing exposure to a sensitive population at fairly high levels of a toxicant lead. This is the toxic legacy of a mine which operated here from the 1920s until 1994. So my travels to Kabwe, I would bring this machine, it gives us an instant reading of lead. And when I got there and took some initial measurements, we found very, very high levels. Over 85% of the children in Kabwe, this was about 200 children in the zone around the mine, uh, had blood lead levels above 45. The number of 45 in the US would put a child in a hospital. Diana's son, Sashi, is five years old. With no testing available, Diana doesn't know what his current lead levels are. But when Professor Caravanas was in Kabwe, he tested children living in similar proximity to the mine. I was shocked. The instrument we used, by the way, peaks out at 60. We had many kids that had a level of 60 plus. So it could have been 110, it could have been 120. That was the highest I've ever seen in my career. Caravanas explains why lead is particularly dangerous for children. So the more lead that's in the body when the brain is forming, the less developed the brain will be. They will have trouble learning because their brain is not, let's say, fully developed. With few public health resources available, it's left to people like Elizabeth Njovu, an environmental health worker, to combat the crisis. 
In the area surrounding the mine, at least half the children here have elevated lead levels in their blood. The people of Kabwe want help. I go out there in the communities to help with the sensitizations about lead poisoning. Today, she's visiting Diana. Because most of the people were not aware of the dangers of lead, the effects it has on the children and the adults. It, it feels powerless. How is it going to end? If a South African law firm has its way, Kabwe's lead pollution story will end with the company it claims is responsible being held to account. Lawyer Zanele Mbuyisa is preparing a class action suit on behalf of Kabwe's residents. The claim is against Anglo-American for their operation at Kabwe from 1925 to 1974. Anglo-American, South Africa's largest mining conglomerate at the time, had a stake in Zambia Broken Hill Development Company, a company that mined lead and zinc in Kabwe. The case is on behalf of children and women of childbearing age. Those children currently await life-saving medical treatment. But that treatment is in short supply. Sashi's lead levels were last tested back in 2021. <laughs> Diana takes Sashi to school, intellectually impaired since birth, and with no treatment in sight, his entire future hangs in the balance. And he's not the only one. We have a problem with our learners. Most of them have got memory loss. When you teach, especially sounds, they usually forget. I think it's from lead poisoning. Most of my learners here, they are affected. They will learn about something today. Tomorrow you ask them, they will just look at you. Health experts warn that continuous high-level lead exposure from birth causes irreparable cognitive damage. The boy has not been improving in learning. He's very much behind. He, he performs as if he's still in preschool. This drastic situation affects just about everyone living near the old mine. This is a very, very serious problem. You go to the churches. We are talking about lead poisoning. You go to schools, it's the same story. To some workplaces, it's the same story. To the households, it's the same story. Elizabeth takes us to see the source of the pollution. So we are in the mine area now, the old mine area. Uh, there's some processing being done. This smoke affects the people around this community. The children get affected, uh, the elderly people get affected as well. This toxic smoke is from the reprocessing of old mine waste. Soon we reach the waste itself. There's a huge heap oh, with, filled with lead contamination. This is what Anglo-American is accused of leaving behind. A vast mountain of hazardous waste. Six and a half million tons of it. The locals have given it a name. This is what they call the Black Mountain. Anglo-American is now headquartered in London. Since the 1950s, while it still had a shareholding in the Kabwe mine, it's positioned itself as a socially responsible company. Anglo-American is a company built on integrity and trust. When our founding chairman, Sir Ernest Oppenheimer, agreed the deal to become the largest single shareholder of De Beers in 1926, it was done on a handshake. In the 1950s, he set a clear direction for the group by explaining that our aim is to make profits for our shareholders, of course, but to do so in a way that makes a real and lasting contribution to the communities in which we operate. We sought an interview with Anglo-American South Africa, who didn't respond. 
Then we tried its international headquarters in London. It declined our interview request, pointing us instead to its website, where it outlined its opposition to the proposed class action suit. Its key argument is that the company held only a minority shareholding in Zambia Broken Hill Development Company, the company which operated the mine between 1925 and 1974. We put the shareholding question to Richard Meeran, a London-based human rights lawyer who's also working on the case. Well, from a legal perspective, the issue of Anglo shareholding on all level in, of investment is a total red herring, it's a complete irrelevance. Anglo's legal responsibility is dependent on the role that Anglo played, which affected control of lead emissions from the mine and surveillance of lead poisoning. Anglo completely failed. And it especially failed because its own mining doctors had drawn attention to massive contamination Zanele Mbuyisa says there was one doctor in particular who alerted the company to the crisis in Kabwe. There's the affidavit of Dr Ian Lawrence, a young doctor who went to work at uh, the mine hospital. And this was in late 60s, early 70s. And while when he got there, he immediately saw that there was a problem with the children, uh, children dying. He wrote, I became deeply concerned at the number of deaths amongst children under the age of five in their residential township particularly of children between one and three years old. The difference in the number of deaths between mine children and local children was reasonably significant, so much so that I could not understand why no one else had raised the issue or carried out an investigation. Because of the colonial attitudes at the time, I don't think they even considered Africans or black people as people. Back in Kabwe, we visited the home of Matthias Chattapankana, a former mine employee. He was gifted a house near the mine, but there was a catch. These are the houses which were occupied by whites. Early, the mine, when the mine started. Now, because of uh, the fumes from the mines, from the furnaces, these people were removed to new township Luangwa. And the Africans were now given this house to be staying in. So we Africans remain here swallowing the dust, swallowing the smoke. As a result, we are very badly affected with lead in our blood. The life of miners, African miners here in Kawa was not good. There was a lot of segregation. Africans on their own and the whites on their own. Once you are employed and you just make a simple mistake, you are slapped. Stupid macaca. Is this the shovel which I told you to bring? A slap goes in. And that man will go holding his cheek or his ear. Sometimes he goes crying. Anglo claims that during its involvement in the mine between 1925 and 1974, its conduct resulted in little, if any, lead pollution in Kabwe. Matthias paints a different picture. Zambians we are always in the forefront, doing the work there, with the, maybe one white man who comes there to supervise you with a mask on his mouth, but you are working without protective clothes. We were in Dags, we didn't know anything that the lead is a serious poison to the human body. Did you get sick? Yeah, go to the hospital, to, you've got a bit of lead. I couldn't go anyway. I was just a simple employee. But when a, a white man gets sick of lead poison, he was sent to South Africa for medical treatment. So do you think Anglo did enough to prevent lead pollution? Nothing, no. What they wanted was just lead and zinc from the mines. And we were using as tongs or tools to produce that lead. And the lead remains in the soil to this day. The dust, anything you touch, there's da- is lead. The Anglo-American can't do anything. He just went and took their lead and zinc and all the money, they went home. The mine was nationalized in 1971. 
an Anglo-American divested from it soon afterwards. With its productivity in decline, it shut down permanently in 1994. But that didn't entirely stop activity around the old mine. Elizabeth, the local environmentalist, takes us to see what happens there nowadays. The mine waste still offers opportunity for artisanal miners, as they're euphemistically known. They scavenge Black Mountain for lead and other minerals, which can later be sold for reprocessing. Elizabeth arranged for us to meet one of them, a man called Simon. Fearing for his safety, Simon would only do that in a remote corner of Black Mountain, well out of sight of other miners. Here yeah, we are digging lead and stones. This is lead. Yeah, it's the spoilers. It makes you sick. Yes. Of but course. why do you do it then? We were saying, no, no work, no way out, something to eat, to provide our families. It's hard working and it's very dangerous to human beings. With no other job options for Simon and Kabwe, he's been doing this work since he was 19. That was 30 years ago. I love what TV quit that so. I didn't say he had a TV and said he had a TV and said he had a TV and said he had a TV. Later, we continued the interview at his house. He does what he can to protect his children from the lead dust he brings home. But it doesn't help. Hey, they get sick. Two of them, they are finding lead in their line. In so, your children? Yeah, my children now. At this point, Simon got nervous. We had to come here secretly. Are you scared of the other men? Yes, because they can kill us. Why? They don't want anyone to, to see us. So even myself, I'm at risk. If they saw me, they can kill me in, in the compound. So we must go now? Yes, we can go. He had good reason to be scared. While leaving Black Mountain, we were accosted by the local mafia. They were angry we'd been filming in the area. Luckily, they let us go, but only after Elizabeth made a call to a local politician we'd interviewed a day earlier. You've seen how hostile they've become? I wanted to get your phone and delete the stuff. Anglo-American is seized on the fact that mining and processing activity continued long after it ceased to be involved in Kabwe. That was back in 1974. It argues that the company is being blamed for pollution and harm that others have caused. Richard Meeran disputes this argument. Something like two thirds of the lead production occurred during the Anglo period. The bulk of the current contamination of the environment is attributable to the time when it was an Anglo operation. The case itself has been dragging on for decades. I guess now it's about 18, if not 19 years ago, when we got approached by the Cabo residents. Now, in late 2023, Zanele and Richard are waiting on the courts to decide whether the class action suit can proceed. It's called a certification. So since um, the certification hearing in January, we've had three postponements. So we've had to call a meeting to update the clients. We'll probably go to recovery in December, January again. In the meantime, the situation in Kabwe remains dire. How are you? Good to see you. How are things in Kabwe today? Julianne Kippenberg from Human Rights Watch has been monitoring how the Zambian authorities have responded to the crisis. We have to look at both the responsibility of companies, but also the obligation of governments. Previous governments have really done almost virtually nothing. Nearly 30 years after the closure of the mine, people's rights are violated on a daily basis. But hopes have been raised by the election of a new government in 2021. What the Zambian government has done, together with a loan from the World Bank, is provide testing and treatment and to remediate some home areas, as well as a very polluted canal. We interviewed Chrysostopiri, 
the recently elected Kabwe district MP, to find out how the new government's lead remediation efforts were progressing. The government have done a lot. There's a canal that we are cleaning up just to make sure they're free flow of water. In certain areas, they will tend their soils. Then in certain areas, they will, per they will pave the yards just to protect children. These and other activities are financed by the World Bank as part of a five-year, 65 million US dollar project called ZIMREP. The project was supposed to kick off back in 2016. People were very upset because the project was indeed started officially in December 2016, but by 2019, nothing, nothing had happened on the ground. There were issues around mismanagement and really poor um, transparency of the project. So people in the community in Kabul felt like they don't really know where this money went, what's actually happening with this project. Perhaps most urgently needed was the testing and treatment of thousands of lead-affected children. But in 2021, that initiative stalled. Sashi and thousands of other children were left without treatment. Neither Zambian government officials nor the World Bank would answer specific questions about this. But Chrysostopiri told us what appeared to have happened. So uh, Zambia bought the testing kits, same week of de delivering. They found out that uh, test kits were found to be defective, meaning they could not go ahead and treat. And, but meanwhile, the medicine also was procured. But, um, you know, sometimes the civil servants, the way they operate, it's not very good in terms of service delivery. What I discovered only in what I did was the letters were written for them to make sure that they buy another testing machine that they had been using. But somebody who was negligent could not act on that till the medicines expired. According to Human Rights Watch, this wasn't the only problem with the project. Just last year, the World Bank's own public reporting on this ranked the project as moderately unsatisfactory. So even the World Bank itself recognised there were major issues. We tried to put some of these issues to the one Zimrep representative who was authorised to speak to us. Some people like Human Rights Watch say that you're not doing enough. As a project, we're firm to say that our goal our objective is to reduce environmental health risks to critically polluted areas. But they won't solve it. They will help to reduce the environmental health risks. Is that preventing lead contamination in children? As I earlier mentioned, our goal is to reduce environmental health risks. Human Rights Watch disagrees. We are saying this project hasn't really achieved a whole lot. What is really needed is a proper clean-up, proper remediation of the mine. Any kind of other effort to test children, clean up homes, uh, pave roads, uh, clean up other public areas like schools will actually be very, very quickly reversed and will be potentially futile. Many in Kabwe are now pinning their hopes on the lawsuit against Anglo-American. But in December 2023, those hopes were dealt a serious blow. South Africa's High Court dismissed the class action suit. The judge labelled the claim factually and legally flawed. We're obviously very disappointed and surprised by the decision. The legal team visits Kabwe to pass on the bad news and to decide what happens next. We believe that it is fundamentally wrong and flawed and therefore the appeal procedure will be followed. The communities are keen that that should happen. But for now, with little foreseeable help on the horizon for the people of Kabwe, all they can do is pray. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure.